The Tropico series has been running since the original came out way back in 2001. It saw a pirate themed sequel release in 2003 before both Tropico 3 and 4 were made available on the Xbox 360 as well as having the standard PC releases. Tropico 5 also released on current gen consoles before game number 6 released across most formats. This is the game that is now about to release on the Switch. Is it more El Presidente or El Widow Twanky? I'm Glenn Bolger, thank you to the publishing team for the review code and now let's find out. You play as El Presidente, leader of the fictitious land of Tropico. You must build up your land as you see fit, ruling with empathy and grace or an iron fist as you make your way through the eras of time. Joining you on your quest is Penultimo, your second in command, and he brings some comic relief to proceedings as well as advising you at certain points. The writing is of a good standard, filled with humour and colourful characters, and these are most evident in the mission mode, which we'll talk about properly later. Tropico 6 is a construction, city building simulation game. Due to playing as a dictator of an island state, not only will you be developing the island by way of residential or commercial buildings, but you will also need to set up trade links with other countries, try to keep diplomatic relationships with a number of other leaders, raiding other nations and researching constitutions. Ultimately you just have to stay in power, winning elections and avoiding a rebel uprising. This latest version of the franchise sees you building across an archipelago rather than on just one island and these can be connected via ports or bridges which leads to some interesting level design and gives you a bit more scope in terms of building placement. In terms of gameplay modes you have a tutorial, a mission mode and a sandbox mode. The tutorial takes place over six parts starting with the basics of developing an economy by creating goods and setting up trade routes to looking at and increasing the happiness of residents through to more advanced measures such as setting tax rates and dealing with rebels. Mission Mode uses a very interesting concept of Penultimo retelling stories of the dictator's rise to power with each of the 15 missions beginning with a short cutscene explaining the setting. Whilst the first mission must be completed, this will then unlock four more and completing some of these will continue to unlock the rest. Across the missions you will be working your way through four different eras of time. Mission 1 for example takes place in the colonial era and sees you under orders from the crown, having to carry out orders such as building ports, sugar plantations or a rum distillery and successful completion of these will see your mandate as governor extended by a year or so, adding to the 8 years that you begin with. You must use this time to begin a revolution and ultimately declare yourself as ruler of a new independent state. Each of the missions has a focus like this, such as having to put a certain amount of money aside into your Swiss bank account or launching a successful propaganda campaign. The four eras that you will play across are the aforementioned Colonial, the World Wars, the Cold War and Modern Times. Each has its own nuances, specific buildings and challenges when you come across them within the subsequent missions. Generally though within missions you will always be making good use of your commercial buildings, constructing whatever it is you have and then choosing trade links to export the products for the best possible price. You will be presented with proposals from various factions and accepting these proposals will see you rewarded on completion be it with money or possibly new blueprints for buildings to construct whilst rejecting these proposals will see your standing with that organisation deteriorate by a few points. Some of these requests will be just for the rewards as just mentioned, whereas others will be needed in order to move the mission along and get you closer to completing it. One slight negative in this mode was a lack of direction, or at least muddled messages on occasions. For example in mission 1, as part of the story you must build a theatre and then attend. Your second in command tells you this and you accept the invitation. A message pops up at the bottom of the screen to say you have attended the theatre and I waited for the next story related objective to appear. Only it didn't and I continued to complete mandate extension tasks but nothing was really happening. Eventually I went online and discovered that I had to select my president done via a radial wheel in the Switch version and make him visit the theatre. Now I did know that there was a visit option to be fair so I could have put two and two together a bit sooner but the game was telling me that I had visited past tense the theatre so I assumed that it had been done automatically. There were a few little things like this and it does become a bit frustrating because it would have been such an easy fix. Aside from this though there is certainly a lot of depth within the game with you being able to earn research points to put into a number of constitutions, laws and policies that you can then apply and these change through the eras. You have an almanac which will give you an overview of the key statistics such as your current population, resident happiness and your standing with any other factions and you can delve further into this with a variety of bar graphs and heat maps giving you exact information that you can then use to improve certain aspects of your rule. Another weapon in your armoury so to speak is that of raids. 
Raids allow you to attack your enemies via a third party in order to weaken them or put yourself in a position of strength. These change through the eras, so in the colonial era for example, you can set up a pirate's cove and then send the pirates out to loot for resources or find gold, whereas in the Cold War, you will send out guerrilla patrols to quell resistant movements. Later eras work via spies, espionage and computer hacking. You can even send your teams out on heists to steal world famous landmarks from other countries. When it comes to sandbox mode, there are a wealth of options available to you, allowing you to customise the experience exactly to your liking. You can choose the map size, the era in which you start, how much money you start with including having unlimited funds and the difficulty of the other leaders. You can even set the specific win conditions of a map should you want them or you can disable these completely and just grow your island free of worries and stress. The wealth of options you have in terms of the laws you put in place also mean that you can shape your island into a utopia of free healthcare, zero surveillance and opportunities for all or a total police state. This is where a lot of people will spend a huge amount of time and the range of islands really is impressive. The new archipelago system adds a lot to the game just in terms of variety, more so than I originally expected. Control wise the camera is moved via the left stick and zoomed or rotated with the right stick. To tilt the camera you must hold down ZR and then again use the right stick. This works fairly well although it can be a bit cumbersome at times and takes a bit of getting used to. Access to everything you need, buildings, raids, trade links or mission objectives is attached to a radial wheel as I said earlier and this is brought up by pressing ZL and then navigated with the left stick. Whilst the wheel in and of itself is a good idea for a game of this nature on a console and has worked well enough in a few other games I have reviewed, its implementation here is not quite as good. First of all it's incredibly busy with each building type or action represented pictorially rather than with a word making it hard to work out what some of them are at first. Then navigating the wheel itself just feels a bit loose, you won't always land on the picture you want and this is exacerbated further in handheld mode where it's quite difficult to be accurate. Touchscreen is only effective for some of the menus in handheld mode meaning you might need to use the controls to get to one screen before then being able to use it which begs the question why bother? Either that or it's just outrageously unresponsive on some screens, whichever of these it is though neither are great. Gameplay is incredibly deep with the political angle found in this series spicing things up and I enjoyed the missions very much. The new features such as the range of archipelagos allows for more interesting map designs and overall it scores 18 out of 20. Controls are okay, the camera is a bit awkward at first and the radial wheel navigation can be a bit cumbersome, especially in handheld mode, but on the whole they score 13 out of 20. In terms of the visuals, things are a bit of a mixed bag. Yes, the tropical setting is pleasant to look at, there are some genuinely nice moments when the sun begins to set, leading to a very scenic red sky, plus the different eras mean there is some variety in terms of the buildings and the characters. But away from this, there are definitely some issues that need raising. In docked mode, things are okay for the most part, although the frame rate does stutter at times, especially when attempting to turn the camera in a 90 degree motion, and things do look quite jagged. Some levels look better than others, in fact the level of quality between them is quite stark at times and another disappointment is that when zooming the camera in close, something that usually reveals some nice little individual touches or moments of humour or charm in such games, everything just looks quite bland and uninteresting. In handheld mode, things fare worse unfortunately. The frame rate drops to the point where turning the camera begins to happen in instalments and the ships and boats on the sea appear to be performing a Ray Harryhausen stop motion tribute act. The large stutters are just as prevalent and the resolution is incredibly low, meaning that markers and background objects appear blurry with that dreaded Vaseline look taking effect. It's a bit of a chore to play this way, which is a real shame because having such in-depth versions of these particular games to play on the go is what appeals to me most about having them on the Switch. Loading times are quite long, although you won't be loading too often in quick succession thankfully, and I also had one incident of the game crashing on me ironically brought about because I pressed save. Thankfully an auto save had taken place not too long before. Audio on the other hand is actually very good. The music used has a Latin or Caribbean feel to it and creates a nice upbeat vibe as you play. Some of the lines of dialogue are voice acted and this adds to the charm of the game. It's clear that the audio really pushes the angle of the game not taking itself too seriously despite the level of depth and complexity on show and in fairness it does this very well. Visuals are passable in docked mode although the stutters are irritating but this performance takes a further setback in handheld and they score 9 out of 20. Audio has that Caribbean flavour to it with the voice acting adding an extra layer of humour and charm and it scores 17 out of 20.
Tropico 6 costs £44.99, $49 or €49.99 Euros or $75 Australian dollars and it will take up 4.5 gigabytes of your system storage. There are 15 missions to complete, perhaps taking a couple of hours each on average, although these times will vary wildly from one person to another. And this is before mentioning that sandbox mode of course which will last some people until the end of time or at least until Tropico 7 comes out. So content wise there is a fair amount here to keep you occupied but the technical issues do need to be factored into this score too. There is a physical version and I've seen it online for about £38 which may be more palatable to some but on balance value scores 14 out of 20. To conclude, Tropico 6 presents an interesting spin on the city simulation genre with its tales of corruption, espionage and political web weaving complementing the standard city building and construction aspects of such games. The archipelago feature brings some nice variety to maps and the general gameplay is fun, deep and presents a good level of challenge. The sandbox mode has a high level of customization, allowing you to play it exactly as you wish. The problem is the performance on the Switch and whilst it's not a huge issue in docked mode, it is noticeable don't get me wrong, but it is a genre where this doesn't cause too many issues unless you avoid games with performance issues as a matter of principle. It's in handheld that it's most affected and whilst again it's perfectly playable, the technical issues meant I didn't enjoy playing it in this mode as much, which is all the more annoying as this is my preferred way of playing. If you play exclusively in handheld or you own a Switch Lite, I would probably take another 5 points off the final score and if you are buying it this way, just be ready for a bit of a slog until you acclimatise to its limitations. Oh sorry, I have been bleeding a little since I was shot and my head feels very light. Tropico 6 gets a Switch Up score of 71%. Thank you very much for watching this review, I hope you enjoyed it, please do remember to leave a like if you did. Quite a difficult one to score this because the two ways you can play on the Switch offered quite different experiences, but hopefully you got the gist through the words as much as the numbers. A quick thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support, and to each and every one of you for watching our videos. Take care, stay safe, and until next time, happy gaming.